brought a little cool rag. We are in. Hello. A little cool rag. Hi, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, this is going to be a very exciting and interesting conversation, and I'm sure we're all going to learn um, a lot in the process. I want to thank uh, Made in LA for including us in this year's events. Um, tonight, we are dedicating this dialogue to the memory of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yeah. Um, SOS Siren was a response to COVID-19 and physical isolation. Snezhana and I started a collaboration and video dialogue. Um, SOS Siren was born out of that project. Our intention is to give voice to the silence and the silenced. SOS stands for Snezhana and Sharon while also referencing the Morse code distress signal. Siren also has a double meaning. It is both an alarm and references the winged women of Greek mythology. For the 20 days of Made in LA, we have created a variety of programs which include these dialogues, studio visits, two community generated videos, all of which can be found on our website. We are honored to have these two amazing artists with us today and hope that in the future, there will be many, many more dialogues that will look deeply into art practice and address the difficult questions that are not talked about in mainstream media. Um, please post your questions in the chat room and we will get to them at the hour mark. And now I would like to introduce Linda Vallejo. Um, Vallejo consolidates multiple international influences gained from a life of study and travel throughout Europe, the United States and Mexico to create works that investigate contemporary cultural and socio-political issues. Brown Belongings, a solo exhibition featuring 125 works and a 140 page catalog was featured in the New York Times visualizing Latino pop populations through art by Jill Cowan and in the Los Angeles Times, Linda Vallejo and a decade of art that unapologetically embraces brownness by Matt Stromberg. Her work is in many permanent collections nationwide, including LACMA, Museo del, del Barrio in New York, and the Museum of Sonoma County. Thank you for being here, Linda, and we look forward to seeing your work. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. So do we want to start with the slides? As you wish. All right, there we go. I think we need to start at the beginning of the slideshow and make it full screen, please. So Brown Belongings is uh, 10 years of work uh, on the politics of color, class, culture, and now power, and what uh, power means within the nonprofit community or the multicultural community. This first series of pieces that are showing are called the Brown Dot Project, in which I place brown dots on architectural grid paper uh, in a mathematical formula, which actually indicates data. I call them data pictographs. In this case, I think it's 17.5% of New York is Latino. Here I am dotting. Uh, a lot of people think that my imagery is uh, computer generated. And so I always include uh, my hands actually dotting so they can see that I place each dot down by hand. This particular image is Los Angeles at 38.4% uh, Latino. This is also Los Angeles. So as a way to understand them, if it's 38% and there's a thousand squares on this piece of paper, then 380 of those squ thousand squares would be dotted to, present, to represent 38%. Many of these uh, look like uh, weavings or architectural sites. This is Miami, which is 66%. You can hardly see it here. There are so many dots on this page, tens of thousands of dots. Several of these images have 30,000, 40,000 dots to be able to represent the uh, percentage and the data that I am working with. This was actually the second portfolio in this brown work. These are two or three very large scrolls, brown dot scrolls with heads represented using brown dots indicating 
um, variety of uh, data regarding uh, Latino populations, workforce uh, information, uh, health information, um, child mortality, all kinds of things. This is a postcard. I collect Mexican postcards. It's very interesting to try to find postcards about Mexicanos that aren't uh, images of the extreme poor indigent of Mexico in the 30s and the 40s uh, when uh, postcards are being made for tourists. This is a beautiful postcard that's been divided into a series of squares. And then once again, the squares are uh, painted in white, interestingly enough, to indicate a data set. In this particular, in this particular piece, 43.2% uh, of farmers in the United States are Latino. This was produced in 2017. And uh, uh, the white squares over them really is a lot about the desparacidos, the invisibles, the, the uh, whiting out of the Latino community in, La in the United States. These particular data pieces are based on uh, Los, uh, California adobes and were commissioned for, from me by, the LA, by La Plaza of Cultura y Artes that gave me my solo exhibition. This particular piece called Memories of Mexico has a data set to provided in the piece. The top piece here is 20, 25% of Latinos experience discrimination. And the bottom one is 35% of US Latinos voted for Trump in 2017. The number of dots constitute 35% of the total space. Again, more data based on the Brown Dot Project. What is it? 46% of US Latinos are homeowners. And the bottom is 23.8% of sex trafficking victims are Latino. In these cases, I took photographs that I downloaded from the internet. I actually appropriated them. One of my favorite things is to appropriate culture. These are also data pieces, but they are painted on circular paper. So I draw the mandalic form first, I count the number of spaces, and then I paint in the spaces to indicate the data represented. In this case, 53% of US Latinos live in 15 metropolitan areas. This particular piece was just acquired by the city of Santa Monica. This large piece is 43.3% of US farming, forestry and fishery workers are Latino, 43 0.3%. This is really important in understanding essential workers in the United States who have often been called unskilled workers and have been undervalued by the economy of the United States. These are more symbolic pieces called Cultural Enigma, in which I researched a series of cultural imagery. Of course, the backgrounds are painted in shades of brown uh, to ask people if they know and incorporate cultural imagery in their dress, in their daily lives, or in their homes. So now we're on to Make Them All Mexican, which is actually the very first portfolio. And in this particular piece, I've painted Victory Brown, of course. Why can't Victory be brown? <laughs> and it's painted with a car paint to look like milk chocolate. And she's very tall. I think she's uh, maybe almost uh, 50 inches high. This is Super Hombre. Uh, when I actually exhibited this piece and had a panel, a very well-dressed and very respectful Latino man stood up in the audience and said, I love this piece because it makes me believe that I could be a hero too, that I could save my community, that I could be of value to my community with tears in his eyes. This is a picture of the installation to ex uh, exhibition installations from La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, and you see it's a mixture of works on paper and sculpture. Um, the other, you'll see other, there's like, there's a, a I, I repurpose everything and I, I, uh, I appropriate cultural imagery from all over the world. This is an installation of Datos Sagrados at MOLA, the Museum of Latin American Art in Long Beach, a really beautiful installation done for me by this spectacular institution where the Datos Sagrados kind of looks like an installation. They kind of look like a planetary installation. I was very, very pleased with that. And of course, each one of them represents data. This was an installation at the University of Texas A&M, Texas A&M in the Reynolds Gallery that was curated by the students there at the university and they did an excellent job. And this is where I really learned about this idea of stacking and I would very much like to talk about this idea of morphing imagery uh, as we get into our questions later. 
This was my cover on uh, Artillery Magazine in 2012. It's Barney and Fred and Barney, uh, iconic American cartoon characters suddenly are brown. And little Barney, who is the most faithful friend of Fred, is darker than Fred is, and he's kind of reddish. He looks like a Centro Americano. Why can't a short brown guy be your best friend? And here's my first uh, uh, article in the calendar section around a series called uh, Brown Oscars, the Brown Oscars that was uh, brought about by Chon Noriega at uh, the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center who really uh, uh, inspired me to do these works to speak about the lack of Latino faces in movies and in the Academy Awards. This is my recent New York Times article. I was very pleased. They included four images from the Data Sagrados and spoke about the work in a time when we really need to start thinking about our essential workers and their value to American life, visiting Latino populations. This was my LA Times article. I love this, unapologetically embraces brownness. Well, what else could I possibly do? Look at my face. Is it possible for me to, uh, to, to not embrace my brownness? If I did, I don't think I could be as productive as I am. You have to accept who you are to know who your work is, to know what you're meant to do. This is an installation at the Soto Clemente Vélez Art Center in New York in 2014. You can see Super Hombre in there and several of the sculptures on a central table. I designed this installation myself. I was very pleased with it and really happy to be in New York as always. I'm looking forward to going again very, very soon. This is one of the recent pieces. It's a 24 inch tall Coca-Cola bottle with a wooden brown straw in it etched with Mexican details on the front filled with 75 chocolate balls made out of wood. What I did in it is a mathematical thing, as Kalpana might uh, appreciate, is uh, I've, uh, I've said that I'm saying that the bottle constitutes 100% and the 75 bottles inside constitute 75%. 75% of all new jobs between now and 2034 will be filled by Latinos. This is my COVID piece, 27.3% of COVID deaths in the United States are Latino. Uh, weighted uh, distribution as reported on, uh, uh, the, by the CDC in April. And these are uh, a, a short listing of some of the exhibitions that I've been, had the pleasure and the honor to be included in, exhibitions, publications, and special projects, which is something I might draw attention to when I have my, ex my resume, I divide the year into exhibitions, publications, and special projects, because it's important to funding sources and to curators that you are not only involved in exhibitions, but also in working in a broader community through any type of volunteer work or uh, covers of books or university work, et cetera, that isn't necessarily exhibition-based. You can see in 2019, I was really rocking. This year is a little tougher but I have great hopes for the future and I'm already uh, gaining some good interest in the work, which I'm very proud about. Thank you so much. I, I enjoyed looking at your work for years and it's really a pleasure to hear you speak about it. That's I remember great. I reached out to you when that article came out um, in the Times because I was just like screaming and hollering for you. I was so excited. Thank you. So thank you for this great presentation. Um, I'd now like to introduce Kolpana Fudnagera. I apologize if I botched your name. Um, she is a Redlands, California-based visual artist. She was born and raised in Western India where she received her Bachelor of Science in Mathematics. Kolpana and her family decided to move to the United States in mid-2013, after which she decided to pursue her Master of Fine Arts in Craft from Oregon College of Art and Craft, Portland, Oregon. Kalpana focuses on mixed media artworks where she experiments with Western art using religious and cultural content specific to her background as a woman from India. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here and please share your work with us. Yes, so much. Um, hi everyone. I would like to say thank you to all my uh, friends and my family, and special thanks to um, SOS uh, Siren, Sharon and Najina, who invited me and who gave me this great opportunity. Um, I have a big list of, like, I would, I want to thank you to people um, who supported me and who 
like helped me with my journey. Um, but now I would like to share this screen for my work and I would like to talk about my work. So here is yellow turmeric. My, most of my work is turmeric yellow. Um, so first I would like to talk a little bit about my work. Uh, my Indian roots is the entry point for my own work. My work shifted from realistic painting to mixed media art and installation. After I started paying attention to mundane rituals of Indian women, including myself. After becoming an immigrant and experiencing estrangement from my daily activities, I reflected on Hindu religious rituals, which are difficult to separate from Indian, Indian people's daily life, especially the daily life of women who work many hours a day for family and community. Few people remark on the work performed by Hindu women living in India, yet it has a profound effect on Indian society. My art practice is often informed by my cooking practice, merging the contemporary visual voice with the traditional sense of ritual and responsibility to reflect on the work of women. I look to my mother, my uh, mother-in-law, and my um, aunt, whom I call Motamani, uh, for, my daily for their daily devotional practice for my inspiration. Apna? Yes. Uh, I just have one small request. If you can get closer to the mic. Okay. So we can hear you a little bit better when your head is down. It, it's just very okay. Uh, quiet. Oh, okay. okay. Now can you hear me? Yeah, just get a little bit closer. Oh. So we can to the mic. Okay. Better? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, this work is, um, it, when I started learning the language, language is a huge part of my art. Um, and when I moved to the United States, English is my uh, second language. So uh, when I went to school, I had to, I had to uh, translate like hundreds of words in a day. And that became another ritual. Um, and that time I was also working about the religious rituals of the Hindu uh, women. And I seen my mom doing Sahasranama. Uh, so that's the um, entry point that I, this work is a combination of the ritual of language translation and the uh, Hindu religious ritual Sahasranama, which means um, uh, recite thousand names of a deity, mostly Shiva or Vishnu. So in this work, I decided to translate my name into different languages and uh, go a thousand times. So I translated my name in 132 languages and every time it was giving me a different meaning. So my name that was most familiar to me became unfamiliar. And um, every time I was writing my name, I'm dying the canvas and all the 132 languages merge into one language. Um, so it's two different uh, rituals. The idea of repetition, time, ritual, and tediousness are strong components of this work, which also reflects my cooking ritual. So this is the, just um, for my next work, I thought it's a good idea to just uh, give you a suggestion that this is a mala that in Hindu culture or like most, I seen most of the women, but it's like for all of the people mostly doing this, this it has 108 beads and one guru bead. And uh, it's made of particular bead um, seeds like called Rudraksh. So then I decided to take this uh, in my work and especially I made this digital work uh, this is a small video of my installation. Thank you. 
So this work, um, the title of this work was uh, is Mira. Mira is a drink that, um, can you hear me, Najma? Yeah, okay. So again, the work contains language, and this time I decided to uh, use my own language, which is Gujarati, uh, which is a regional language. Um, and uh, I used 108 words, uh, which I have faith in. These are very um, daily, like mother and father and teacher and like very simple words, but we believe in that thing so much that then we don't pay attention to. So I decided to make this digitally and like a prayer. So, and I, in the gallery, I also burn an incense and create that environment that someone is being prayer. And uh, I made this work on different uh, settings too, which had multiple speakers and multiple screens in the gallery. This work is uh, painted prayers. Um, it, uh, in my research, I was reading the book Painted Prayers um, by Stephen Wheeler, who is an American author. And uh, he wrote many, many books uh, about the um, Indian culture, especially Hindu women's uh, rituals. And this is the ritual that in many, many rural India, women paint their uh, walls, the outer walls of their houses to welcome the God and invite the God. Um, and sometimes they do, do rangoli, the white uh, rice powder in front of their door also to invite God. So this ritual is like um, very unknown. I mean, I, I know it, but it's not that much famous. So I decided to make it. And I decided to um, write my own prayers. So I used nails and white threads and I painted the uh, wall red with the house paint. And I made three different iterations. So first I made um, this one uh, in my studio with a book. Uh, just to get that suggestion that there are some codes here. And then second time I made it in the gallery. And then in the gallery, I was uh, going every night to make more forms, more this um, uh, prayers. And it was like, um, I'm going to prayer every night. If it's a prayer, then it should not stop. So then um, it was, and then I also made a gift, which I did not share. And the third work, uh, third work, I would like to talk more on the next screen. Next screen is the painted prayer, which I already said that I was going every night um, for two to three weeks. But yeah, it was in the gallery. And this work, I combined my two different works, but here I used the, the same work, uh, and this time I decided to make a circular form, um, which is connected with the life cycle. And this time I decided to make the, the forms or my language or my prayers um, with the rice paste, which originally used by those women uh, with the rice paste. And uh, then this piece uh, is the, the roti we make every day. Uh, it's, and when I was, uh, the meaning of craft always discussed in the school, when I was in the craft school, the meaning of craft always discussed as the creative material practice. So I begin to understand that my daily practice of making the roti is a craft because I have to understand what, what material, which kind of flower should I use, uh, with how much consistency of water or the doll should be or I need to make practice to make it circle. And um, I always heard, I mean, I even don't remember when did I learn it from very young age, we all sisters uh, were making rotis. And um, I mean, we always heard and made fun that if your roti is not round, you will not get your mother-in-law love is not happy or you will not get a good uh, in-law or a recipe. Husband. So then uh, I made 1,500 rotis and I made a stack of that. And But I also hope that, um, uh, uh, that 
like a, a custom. And 51 is also a significant number that is given as a gift when a girl gets married. So um, I, I was noticing that most of my work has a significant numbers also. 108 is a significant number, 1000 is a significant number, and now 51. Again, significant number, nine, nine head. Um, this, uh, the title of this work is the Navratri. Navratri is a festival. It's a very famous festival in India. And uh, in this uh, work, I decided to uh, make those hair buns that women take so much time to make it and um, to beautify themselves. But it's also like a, like a ritual of some, some women do it every single day and put some real flowers. So I decided to make it very formally and just uh, created nine different forms to, to create nine nights. Navratri means nine nights, and that, which is very um, important uh, uh, festival for Hindu people. So the reputation, again, the reputation and the form and the time taken um, is very important in this work. And when I was making those forms, I had to make two different forms one head and then the hair hair bun so when i was making so many like i was going every single day and morning and to make that girl's form so i i thought that that's another ritual that i'm creating for myself of going and taking care and paying attention and sculpture was not my i never learned um uh, ceramic but uh, that was just this work from the very beginning I have decided to make as a sculpture um, with ceramics. So this is another work. It's stubborn fragility, and I used for to make this form. These are just the clay slip, so it's super delicate. So it's just like me that I'm saying that I am very stubborn, but at the same time very fragile. And this is the same concept that I used. Um, to uh, make the hair bun, but this time I use different materials where I started to use the cheese cloth and like different, so many material, it was so important for me. And I wanted to use the material that we can use in uh, our daily life. This is the show. Um, I feel like uh, it changed my work a lot. I was uh, already started I already started doing research about the Hindu religious rituals and Hindu Hinduism. So it's very cultural. Um, and uh, so I decided to make map of the, the pilgrimage, the Hindu pilgrimage. And then when I was talking to uh, one of my um, friends in, uh, in my college, and she said, oh, we have it here too in Christian a uh, ritual and Christian uh, religion, they have Camino de Santiago. And I was wondering that this is some common thing that many cultural um, cultures share. So then I decided to make different maps. So it's three different maps, three different pilgrimages. And um, one is Hindu, Muslim, and uh, Christian. And all the destination, I nailed it. Uh, and then it's with rock. And then I used all the materials from my mom's shrine. So, which are um, thread, turmeric, rice, um, kung fu, gulal, abu. I mean, th those are different uh, pigments that she used. This is the detail uh, of that work. This is another installation. Um, I made uh, with the three different things. Um, so I made the shape um, and the form is a, a window, which we have uh, some places in India that uh, people go there, tie a red thread and make a wish. Um, I, I'm not a religious person. So sometimes I don't believe on those things, uh, some rituals, but at the same time, I feel like it might have some reasons behind that. So I tied that and it's been like 12 years and I still remember those wishes. So, so then I made 
this work here because it's in my memory and the people enjoyed it. Everyone just tied the thread on the I wish I, I, I that's my plan that if I can make this uh, installation reach. And I invite people to make their wish. This is again another work that I use language and uh, uh, the culture. So it's the same thing that uh, someone can try to wish, but I write a lot and the language, I use the language a lot, but then I don't want anyone to read my books or anything that, so, so then I wrote my uh, journals or uh, papers and then I made them, I converted them to ropes and then I tied them on uh, a cloth. This is um, another work that I made, I used concrete to make um, ladva, which is, um, which is a sweet in Indian dish, Indian uh, culture. And we also, um, when we do prayer, we serve food just like real people. So this is a, um, I named it Ganesh Chaturthi, and in every Ganesh Chaturthi, every, every house, not a single house will miss, make this ladder. It's kind of a circle. Um, these are two pieces I made um, in, in a long canvas, and I created uh, a sari, that, which is Indian uh, traditional dress for women. Um, and I wrote the whole letter uh, on top of that to God, and I made um, the sari form for that. And this is the sari that then I I asked my mom if she can give me some more saris so I can make more insulation with that. And she gave me the sari, uh, which I remember that we uh, both embroidery this. And I think I was in elementary, so I was very young. I was learning with her, um, and more than uh, taking the stitches, I opened them because my mom is very strict about that. She wants; she is very perfectionist, and she wants it very perfect. So if I miss one thing or if I do something wrong, then she will make me open the whole thing. Kalpana. So, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we we're, we're going a little bit long, and I think if you could wrap it up, that would be okay. really really helpful. Okay, then I'll just pass the slide uh, without talking. This is just my uh, current release of about the nakshatra. Uh, maybe we will talk about that and the questions. These are some of my journals um, that I I as I said I write a lot. And this is the one page I was reading my journal and the, my conclusion, I was really interested. The world is always afraid of a woman, a woman who is not afraid. So I would end with that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I thought that perhaps we could start off by talking about the title of this dialogue, No Privilege, No Path, No Power. Um, and maybe a, a more, uh, a clearer way of asking the question might be, would you each speak to what it's been like to be a woman of color in the art world and what the opportunities have been, what the, what the limitations might've been, if there were any? Linda, would you like to start? Hold on, we're, we have to unmute you. Linda, can you unmute yourself? There yes, I am. Thank, thank you. you. What'd you call it? No privilege, no path, no. No power. No power. I don't buy any of it. I refuse that completely. I am privileged. I am. I have a path, and I'm certainly powerful. And that is what I, how I live, and that's how I work. Um. Every artist has uh, difficulties in being an artist. Uh, must be one of the most difficult careers in the world. Uh, it's unregulated. Uh, 
That's a pretty subjective. It's a very subjective business. Um, I basically either you know crawl underneath the fence, jump over the fence, uh, cut the fence, uh, do everything I can to pass into as many worlds as I can with my work. And I know how to um, I know how to uh, recognize a good opportunity when I see it. And I'm happy, very happy in the world that I've been given. And I feel very free within it. And uh, no privilege, no path, no power is nothing that I would ever, I would ever write about myself or my work or my life. It would, I think it's limiting. It's very limiting. I think it's more important to talk about what is available. What's mm -hmm. path, privilege, and power. <laughs> I'd be asking a long time about that. Um, there's a lot of uh, techniques and tools that are available to artists to be able to reach out and discover individuals interested in their work, scholars, curators, historians, museum directors, gallery directors, collectors. Would you talk uh, a little bit about that? Well, it occurred to me when Kalpana was speaking that the first place I would go if I was her is I would... Uh, Go to academia.edu and type in Hindu. Type in curator at the top and see who comes up who's writing books about uh, Hindu cultural uh, efforts in the fine arts. I mean, if that's what your work is about, then that's the crew that you need to begin looking for, uh, depending on what your work is about. Um, the majority of my support right now, of course, is coming from Latinx uh, centers, museums, collectors, curators, um, you know, individuals who are interested in this conversation. Um, when you're producing a, a, a type of work, uh, it's, it's really about searching for those connections that you're able to build based on the topic that you wanna talk about. You know, and um, I was talking to Kalpana a little bit earlier today and uh, I asked her if she has a website and she doesn't have a website. And to me, that's a first red flag. If you want the world to know about your work, you have to be very savvy about social media and how it functions today. Like before, for those of us that can go back farther, you know, you had to have a packet of slides and a resume printed out on a piece of paper and you had to be able to have the guts to deliver it. You had to actually walk in and deliver the thing, which was pretty scary. Nowadays you can send things or, you know, you know usher people towards your website and uh, share a lot of what you're doing with a community that cares about what you're doing. I don't find, I, I have too much work. I have too much going on. I have so much going on and so many people are interested and I welcome many people to my studio. I love talking with people about the work, not so much talking about the work. I'd rather have you just look at the work than talk about the work. But I love talking about process. I love talking about creative process. I love talking about impetus. It's very important to me. Why? Why do you do this? And I find very meaningful conversations with all kinds of individuals who are in who have dedicated just as much. Um, I recently had a privilege of speaking at Cal State University Long Beach for a day in front of 200 people, you know, uh, students who wanted to be artists. And I just said, you know. If you're making work about Latinx communities and you meet a curator that's uh, focused, whose main focus is, you know, Egyptian history, they're not going to be interested in your work. <laughs> Why would they, right? So it's really about focusing your approach to the people who are interested in talking about and studying and exhibiting and writing about what you produce. And that isn't really done if you're an individual artist like Kalpana is and I am who create individual images based on our own biographical and cultural, political, sociological interests, you know, personal interests, then that's not gonna really fit into a, a group box very well. So it doesn't fit, my work doesn't fit like into a group box. I have to go out and forge my own roads to my own career. Uh, there's a lot of people around me doing Latinx imagery but I'm working very hard to make the unique image that incorporates math, that incorporates uh, a double, triple, and quadruple entendre and humor, which is my favorite thing. Did I answer that question in any way? Yes, you did. It was fantastic. Thank you.
Uh, Kalpana, do you want to speak to it? Um, I feel like I have the opposite of Linda. I uh, inherited like six, seven years ago. So I, um, before I went to school, I did not know anyone. I didn't have any network. I don't know and like Indian culture that much here. So I don't have that much support. So I feel like I'm not that privileged, uh, but I studied in a very good school uh, that I'm in. I have so many friends, so many professors now. Snezhna is amazing. I studied under her. Um, and Janine Nagy, um, she is my um, favorite professor, one of her favorite too. Um, she's still in my touch. She's still in my touch and like guiding me um, to many good. places. So um, I feel like I have a long way to go still. Mm, you're young. You don't have that long way to go. Uh, <laughs> you're very young. You have a lot ahead of you and you should just jump into the water and learn how to swim as quickly as possible. Or before you know it, you'll wake up and you'll be as old as I am and you'll say, what, what did I do? Where did I go wrong? Um, you know, I hang out with people who do all kinds of stuff. I just don't hang out with people who do Latinx stuff. I hang out with people from all over the place that do all kinds of work, that have all kinds of orientations and come from all different kinds of towns and cities. And you'd be surprised where opportunities arise. You'd be, you'd be shocked. And the only way to really find them is to go out, reach out, reach out, collaborate, converse. You know, this is the only way to do it. I, I have several very talented friends of all different elks that uh, are waiting for someone to come. They're waiting for the opportunities to come. And it's, that's not, unfortunately, that is not how it works. It's not how it works. You really have to reach out and make friends and colleagues and develop conversations and do all that hard work. Artists, unfortunately, call it PR. Uh, they call it publicity. They call it PR. They call it promoting, which puts the wrong uh, emphasis on it. It's really more relationship building of like-minded individuals and interesting people. One of my favorite people to talk to doesn't do the kind of work I do at all, but we can really get into a good conversation about what drives us. Linda, would you say something about, given that we're in COVID and in isolation mostly, how you would suggest a younger artist would reach out and create those connections and build community? I mean, everybody's getting really into, into Zoom these days. I, I, this is my third Zoom meeting today. <laughs> and I'm in Zoom all the time. It's really interesting how everybody's just sort of taken on to Zoom. It's quite wonderful. You can stay in your studio and talk to people about stuff. It's really interesting. I think that uh, when, if, when COVID first came out, I told some of my friends, I said, uh, and I, I, I suggest this to every artist, is uh, to keep producing. Uh, to keep producing, don't stop, no matter how you feel, because everybody says that they, you know, their, their, their emotions are doing this because it keeps going on and on and on and on. At first, a lot of jokes, uh, visual jokes on uh, Facebook, as an example, were like, oh, I'm just happy to be in the studio. This is everything I've ever wanted. I don't have to go anywhere I can produce. And three months later, it wasn't the same song. People were starting to hit the wall. Um, you, I suggest that artists stay positive about their work research about their work, study. Now's a good time to do study. And now's the time to reach out on um, social media. This is, uh, this is what we wanted. We wanted to be connected to our machines and guess what? Now we get to have it. So now's the time to do social media. Now's the time to put out a newsletter, a quarterly newsletter. Many of my artist colleagues get copies of my artist newsletter. I send it out with good news, uh, product, projects in process so that people learn about my work. Now's the time to establish a store on your website. Now's the time to upgrade your website. Now's the time to develop these kinds of communication skills because they are here and they're here to stay. They are here to stay. And um, uh, I basically reach out in very friendly and professional and um, uh, Formal language, actually, I tend to be more formal than other people because uh, of the way that I grew up, where I will find someone on academia.edu or I'll find someone on Facebook or I'll find, a, I'll find someone in an article or someone will refer someone to me during conversation or email communication and I'll simply write to them. 
and thank them for the opportunity to introduce myself. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce myself and my work. I'm happy to report. And then I tell them some little bit of good news. And then I say, if you have time to visit my website, it would be wonderful to hear your thoughts on the work. Best regards with my email, at, I'm with my website at the bottom. And I just use uh, regular forms of communication and what I call reaching out. And if you reach out to the, to the people who care about what you're talking about, they love to start a conversation. Everybody's pretty lonely right now. They don't get to see anybody. So now's a good time to begin a, a, a campaign of how to reach out. And I don't let anything go by, you know, like I meet somebody and I don't hem and haw about, oh, gee, should I call? Oh, gee, should I? Oh, my goodness, should I? Can't I? Would I? Should I? You know, all these. What was it again? No privilege, no path, no power. Now forget that. I just forget it. Just take it, put it in a box. I don't know. I, I would put it in the trash. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even keep it in my house and just say, oh, well, I wonder how I could reach out to this person. I have, my, I have my newsletter, I have my website that I've worked to make very beautiful, and I'm just gonna be polite and professional and simply reach out. Um, I saw, uh, you know, dear Kalp and I, I really appreciated seeing your work in the slideshow the other day. It was really quite wonderful. Um, you know, I hope that you'll visit my website. It, it's not very difficult and um, there's nothing to be afraid of. That I think is the key to all of these words. There is nothing to be afraid of. Um, Linda, do you think the, the opportunities been changed? But when you were going like for meeting person in in person, and now it's online, does it change anything? Not really. Not really. It's about communication. I mean, you know, I'd be stupid to say that women have had all the same opportunities as male artists in the history of art. You know, we all know what the percentages are. We all know what that is. Well, what is it? 20% of galleries is, are feminine. What? 25% of the museum. I mean, I could go through the whole reason why I have no privilege, no path, and no power. You know, just, just I, could, I could write a paper on it and really make myself feel down and out. But I'm just, like I said, I'm cutting through fences. I'm jumping fences. I'm digging under fences. And I'm just finding my own path in, in a way that makes the most sense in terms of good relationships with people who care about what I'm doing. Things have changed a great deal, but... Social media actually makes it a lot easier than it was before. Can you imagine having to send out packages? We used to spend tens, we used to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on slides, a very expensive object, and never get them back. We would send them out and never get them back. And people, because it was mail, no one thought about getting back to you. I always get responses back, but my <clears throat> emails are very short and polite and filled with some good information. I recently created my archives on my website, uh, 1969 to to 2020 uh, with archival information included in PDF form, uh, ephemera and archival. I got all my boxes of stuff out and I've spent the last six years scanning everything and uploading thousands of images. I invite you to come and take a look at the archives because they're a pretty good example of what can be done. And so if you, uh, if you click on an exhibition in my CV, it takes you to a post that tells you everything about what happened in the exhibition with a slideshow at the top. But it also lists all the other artists that were included in the show, not just my name, but everybody else who was in it. It was a group show. Plus, you know, uh, there'll be a PDF download of the, of what, the press release, the, the, the postcard, the small publication, the, uh, you know, a, a link to the site where it was held, if, it, if it's still alive today. And I found that uh, a lot of historians, scholars, and curators love this stuff. So I use that as really good news a lot. You know, it's really a pleasure to uh, be a part of a Zoom with you the other day. I thought I'd introduce myself a little further and share with you the really good news that I've just completed my archives uh, with attached PDF downloadable ephemera, which I think you might find interesting. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Please be well and stay safe. Best regards like this, very simple outreach. Um, I've been involved in what the nonprofit arena for many years, starting out with self-help graphics in 1977. And uh, I'm a, my, my day job is I'm a development officer and a grant writer. And so I've learned a lot. I've become a communications expert within it all, writing grants, how to communicate, whether it's in the written word or in meetings or how to present yourself, et cetera, et cetera. And those skills have really come handy in terms of just being comfortable and talking to people about the work. I think that's one of the first hurdles that artists have. They don't feel comfortable, so they shy away. You have to be comfortable. 
Yeah. So, can, on the topic of talk about your work, uh, Linda, you mentioned uh, you you would like to share with us uh, something about your process of stacking and morphing. Yeah, uh, that you mentioned in your presentation. Would you like to share that? May I? I would really like to. Share yes, it. we would love to hear the process and we'll talk Kalpana too about her process. So, her Linda, morphing, please. Yeah. Um, well, I was at uh, the Texas A&M University and I, uh, I, whenever I have a show, I always say, I wanna to talk to everybody. Please, please plan panels, please plan talks. I'm happy to speak to anybody who comes, you know, your docents, everybody. I love th that adds a lot to exhibitions. What uh, departments of education and museums and galleries and universities just love an artist who's willing to you know, share. And so when I was at Texas A&M, I said the same thing. And I had a beautiful group of MFA students out of the uh, art department who were using um, a Maya software to uh, create cartoons, create cartoons, that's what they were doing. And they came in and we were supposed to have a 45 minute chat and we ended up having like an hour and a half. We just couldn't leave because we were in it. We were in the zone, we were just in the zone. Everybody was just like in it, all of us. And, um, they talked to me about dimensions, what they called was dimensions. And basically I, I have translated this word dimensions into stacking because it just seems to make easier sense. Where you have a, an object very simply that might include a cartoon character, um, uh, a time of day, what we're stacking now, right? Time, let's say sunset and the computer and uh, a piece of classical music. So you're stacking basically the elements of the object. You put them on top of each other and the weaving to or the melding of those four objects together, those four elements, those, those four stacked dimensions create what the work looks like. So if we were to look at uh, my work just to begin with, it's basically what cultural information, statistical information, work on paper, right? A tech, a, tech, a tech aspect to it, right? And uh, the cultural information gets pretty dense. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty dense package, but the math is just basically the research that you have the brown dotting and that might be considered a rudimentary stack uh, that would describe my, the work that I'm working on, process that I have. Kalpana would probably would be cultural information, uh, what she talked was language, she mentioned language, and she had mathematics. And then, of course, she, she talked uh, uh, about family. There was a sort of a, a familiar, a personal relationship thing going on with that. And that stack creates the dimensions of which she creates her work. So there you are, an artist. And if you can take any portfolio of work and analyze it in a way that you understand what the stack is that's making those pieces, right? Then you can take a piece out, a dimension out, you could add a dimension. So in this particular case, I've added three-dimensional mathematics, if you will. I said, what happens if I make, what, what happens if I do the numbers in 3D? Can I do that? And suddenly I've added to the dimension to the stack. And then of course I had to think about that for quite some time before I said, oh damn, I could do that. Oh damn, I could do that. Oh shh, I could do that. So a lot of artists, what they do is they First of all, they can't analyze, they don't analyze their work to understand what the actual influences of the work are, where it's all coming from so they can see what the stack is. Some artists make stacks that are so tall that they can't figure out what the work is at all. It's coming from 18 different directions at one time. And a lot of times what that is, is that you take the very tall stack and you divide it into four. And each one of those stacks represents a different portfolio of art. If you wanna morph your art into the next, like you're creating work that's always the same, and you don't know how to make it different, somehow or another add an element to it that makes it, that moves it along, if you will. I'm always interested in moving the work to the next level is you add something to the stack. And suddenly what I call is, I call it morphing, where you're making this piece here and suddenly a new piece comes up out of it, morphed it, but they're connected to each other. And this is very important in terms of process and very in, in practice that you don't just jump from one portfolio to the next, but that they are actually related to each other. So you can morph work, you can, uh, you can add the stacks, add dimensions, right? You can, add, you can subtract them, you can change them out. Like that's not working, that's not working. 
let me take that one out and put this one in. Oh, and then all of a sudden something else can happen. So I learned this from the um, MFA students at uh, Texas A&M. You can see the conversation that we had because everybody all of a sudden wanted to talk about their, their dimensions, their stack. Everybody wanted to sit down and have every, speak them out loud so they could begin to see what is this image about? What am I really, I think the ultimate of it is what am I trying to say and have I done it successfully? What am I trying to convey? What am I working to convey? And does this stack share that thought to the best it possibly can? When I went from Make Them All Mexican to the Brown Dot Project, it took me four years to figure that stack out. Not just to lay them up together, because that's the easy part, but how do you translate that into an image, into a viable but dynamic image? Would you like that? How was that? Really good. Yeah, I suggest that you consider tonight when, you, when we're done to just sit down and start writing that idea down, because it can really help you see more clearly and devise more clearly. And we're all very intelligent. We can come up with the next level. It's not a problem. It's just about how much brain trust are you interested in putting into this next image? When I was creating Make Them All Mexican, people were like, where did you get this idea? How did you do this? How did you do this? I go, it took me, it took four years to find it. Uh, it took four years to create the stack that made sense. So art doesn't just, oh, I'm, for me, it's not, I'm just gonna sit down and start painting and see what happens. That's a totally different process. And that's a tough process too, but that's not how I work. Elfna, do you see yourself in, in the stacking idea? Um, as I, a process? I feel like um, I haven't think about the stacking idea, but um, um, my process is just like my cooking process. Sometimes I decide the menu first and then go find the ingredients. And sometimes I just, Look at the ingredients first. That what do I have in my uh, pantry, and then I decide the dish. So same thing that I write a lot. Um, so sometimes when I'm writing, I get some idea, and then I'm like, okay, I need to work on this. And sometimes, um, but but once I decide that okay, I want to work on this, then I have to decide the the material because I feel like I'm very much uh, into material because of my craft uh, study. Um, so the material and the process is very also important. Uh, so I will go like step by step and sometimes it comes so quickly. That the, the series I'm working right now is uh, I just went into my uh, the workplace and then I thought, okay, what do I have? And then how can I start? So I saw that I have window screen and then I decided, to, okay, let me start from embroidery that I already know. And then embroidery took me to the, the the pattern what I want to make, and then I went to the the subject that I want to talk about the nakshatra. Uh, so nakshatra is a, a lunar mansion that I want to work on now. So that's how I, I work sometimes. Um, it feels sometimes like oh I got the idea, and but I make sure that it's now Linda said that it's my step and. No matter now, I'm because I write about it, it will be connected with my work. Mm -hmm. It's not coming like from far, uh, mm -hmm. suddenly like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, are you guys saying that we are not relying so much on inspiration, but more on the whole process that's very analytical and building blocks mm -hmm. uh, that are bringing together the ideas and with the research that we do. Uh, Am I, I hearing it correctly? So no inspiration, no imagery is coming, but more hard work building up the stacks. Um, I would say that um, I call it intellectual property. Uh, I use that phrase a lot of times in my statements. Um, and the example that I make is that when 9-11 hit, all the artists were painting flags and it was very um, popular for a little bit of time. But I collected a lot of information about 9-11, which I still have in my possession, but I still haven't created my 9-11 image. It may never come. I was uh, involved in the Chicano Latino community for 40 years without uh, necessarily producing a Chicano Latino image. 
And one day I woke up and a tipping point hit. And the inspiration came from a collection of experiences, knowledge, investigations in that community that just happened organically. It happened organically and it is inspiration, but it came uh, after the, the bucket was flowing over one day and I just, it hit me what I needed to do. So inspiration is certainly a part of it, but what I'm more or less talking about is how you take inspiration and create object out of it. What, how, how the process, how does inspiration turn into object? And that is a completely different thing than collecting information or experiences or study or relationships, right? Within a, within a particular arena or topic, how do, you, how, do you, how do you create object out of that? And that's where you have to have a practice, why they call it a practice or a process. And a lot of mine is experimentation and uh, failure and success. Ex failure and success in experimentation, which is a part of my practice, is to get an idea, try it out, and then it doesn't work. Ex it, it's not, that's not it. You, you know how that is. You look at it, you go, that's not it. It's getting, it's a little close, a little, a little closer. That, that, that's just not it. And uh, so inspiration, yes, of course, but taking inspiration and making object out of it is takes a dedication and a determination that needs that must be developed and practiced literally. I once had a conversation with an Italian artist who said that she had to leave Italy in order to be free of the history that uh -huh. she came from and that she had to abandon painting in order to break free of the Renaissance. Yeah, I can so imagine. I wonder um, you both use very unusual materials uh, or even ordinary materials in a very unusual way. And I wonder if you could speak to your relationship to the materials that you do use. Why don't you start, Kalpana? So I, I um, like to collect the material. Um, wherever I go, I feel like, okay, I can use this. And sometimes, as I said, sometimes I choose the subject first or like decide to work first. And then I go find the material and then I do some trial and error that what can go on sometimes for my Navratri project, even though I didn't know the sculpture or the clay, I was very firm from the very beginning that I want to make a sculpture about this work. And then I started going to the uh, ceramic studio. Uh, but usually I, I keep collecting the material, but I make sure that that's from my daily material, like a daily life. You, I wonder when I was telling that story specifically about you, because you're using materials that are integral to your culture, and yet I think if you'd made you'd made the same work in India, it would you wouldn't have had the perspective to see the materials in the same way. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. When I was in India, I was just doing painting on canvas. I mean, I did some. Uh, I just did this the same thing, like a, a tied up red. It was just a, a painting, not the installation that I did here. Yeah. When you are far from your culture, I feel like you hold the roots more tight. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting. I saw, I was painting and I was doing a series of uh, fantastic realism landscapes called The Electrics, uh, based on uh, hippie psychedelia, spiritual vision search, and digital imagery. And uh, I was having some good success with it and having some fun with it, painting some pretty large things. I was electrifying landscapes of all kinds, electrifying faces and heads as well. And I was pretty much dedicated to that work. I was pretty happy about it. And I had been traveling to teach, I traveled for about two and a half years teaching, uh, grant writing. And uh, I was going to major cities and I was going to all the museums when I was in town. Part of my routine was to work all day and go to shows all night. And uh, I saw a great show at uh, the New Museum. It looked like a uh, homeless person had gone amok and made all kinds of work all over the museum. The entire place was taken up. 
with repurposed objects. And I saw some very beautiful uh, repurposed objects around in museums all over the nation and also in China that use a very normal objects, very you know, like coat hangers and newspapers. Uh, and there was a, it was in like a 2000, 2004. And I saw all these works making um, art out of repurposed object. And uh, I always start my process with a question. And so I asked my, myself the question, which is, it's a very, it's a, it's a pretty exciting and scary thing at one time. Uh, wonder what my work would look like if I used repurposed object. Wonder what would happen? What would happen if I, if I use repurposed object and this is my, I'm creating my stack, right? From a, my cultural point of view, I wonder what would happen. And I spent the next uh, four years, uh, three years, uh, uh, collecting stuff from antique malls, not really knowing where I was going, just sort of collecting things from antique malls. And creating, I started looking for uh, Mexican imagery in the, in the malls and I could find nothing. There was nothing. Little salt shakers of sleepy little Mexicans against, against cactus is all I could find. It was really depressing. And I tried to find architectural imagery and I could find all kinds of European architectural imagery reproduced. But I could find no Mexican uh, architectural uh, site imagery being reproduced anywhere. And I didn't know what to do. And I was just creating all these other objects uh, based on uh, European experience and uh, experiences with uh, nature. And one day I went to the uh, Teak Mall again, which is actually a, a cultural, it's a cultural component of being a Latin American. I don't know whether you know this or not, but we love segundas, what we call the segunda. because you know, you have working poor families and they shop a lot in secondhand stores. So everybody understands that there's a cultural component to this. And one day I was in the mall and I saw two little, um, I, well, the first one that I saw was a Dick and Jane primer. Anybody remember the Dick and Jane? C Spot, C Jane, C Jop. It was like a little children's book that everybody lived with in the 50s. And uh, all the children are red haired and green eyed or blonde haired and blue eyed, right? Yeah. And I looked at them yeah. and I, 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 I shouted some explicative MFS. I could paint them brown. Oh my God. Oh my God. And it, it came to me like that. And then I found uh, two little uh, 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 salt and pepper shakers with the pilgrims. And I said, wouldn't that be great? Let's just turn Thanksgiving on its head. Who invited who to dinner anyway? I'd like to know. And it was just funny and it was... There was just something about it that just sort of punched. It just punched you. Uh, but in a good way, it wasn't like it was in the face or anything. It was just kind of like, wake up. And so that's how the media hit me in that particular way, because I asked a question. The next question was, how do I keep, people said, so what are you working on now, Linda? Because everybody was, was uh, testing me. <laughs> so now what are you going to do? You didn't make them all Mexican. So now what are you going to do? Asking me if I could morph, you know, not asking me, can you morph this? And I asked the question, I wonder what would happen if I was a minimalist? So what are you working on now, Linda? I said, well, I'm keeping it brown. And I get a laugh. I said, eh, you know, I'm thinking, what would I do if I, became, was, a, if I was a minimalist? Because all the sculpture was super gaudy and over the top. And I was, oh, it's just so gaudy. I thought, I'd be a minimalist. So, you know, media, um, media has to match the idea. It, that's part of the stack. And you got to get that right. And unlike Kalpana, I don't start with the media first and then match the idea to the media. I have the image first and then match the, 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 uh, the media to it after the fact. Uh, that's, how my, that's how my practice functions, where the idea is king or queen in this case. Idea is queen. Mm -hmm. And from that comes the media. And the, uh, the stack starts. The stack starts. And... Uh, in this case, it was pretty much serendipitous, but a lot of search. I've, I must have gone, <laughs> I think I went through every antique mall in Southern California when they were open. I, I missed them very much. <laughs> I missed them a great deal. <laughs> How was that? Do have any questions from viewers? Um, I think this is a place where uh, we invite viewers to uh, participate and send us the questions because we did not receive anything so far uh, from the audience. Ah. 
but um, talking about the um, the privilege or lack of um, just it seems that even though that Kalpna feels as a relative newcomer to America that the resources are not readily available. Um, I still think by knowing you, Kalpna, uh, mm -hmm. the, the path that you have is pretty amazing. Would you share with us, like you came six years ago, how was your English level? What was your dream? How did you end up in MFA program? And how did you start uh, entertaining the idea of becoming artist uh, with your family? Uh, keeping in mind that you have a family and I mean, full blown with the kids, two sons and so forth. So would you share? Yeah, so um, when I realized that I love art, I mean, I was doing uh, some uh, drawings and everything in school, but uh, then um, when I have, when I was doing uh, art projects with my own children, I realized that I love art. I, I would like to do this. Before them, I was finishing their children coloring book. So I went to the art school and I said, I want to study here. And they said, uh, what's your age? And I was 25 years and six months old. And they said, oh, we have age limit. It's 25 years, so you are not eligible. So then I the thing I can do about that. So I waited until my both sons, I had two boys. Uh, and so they went to high school. Um, and when they went to high school, became a little bit independent, then I joined an art school, uh, private art school. Um, and then I met with a few artists, uh, two of them became very, uh, my mentor and my friends, uh, Jignesh and Amit. Um, and, uh, but I could not study. So then when I had decided, my, me and my family decided to move to the United States, I was very happy and very excited that I can go and study here but I didn't know how to go. So I joined a community school and I never have um, any art background. So I thought, okay, let me take the good idea. So I took all my general classes and of course with Smejna uh, and Jimmy. Um, uh, so Smejna is my, like she and both well, Janine also knew OCAC. So she mentioned that you can join this amazing school and Smejna showed me the path that how can I go to the MFA. Language barrier was a big, big issue, but um, my two my two sons, uh, Siddhartha Shri, they studied in English. Um, so they always, always um, check my, all the writing. I write a lot, but not in English. So um, that was the issue and then uh, when I decided I got the admission in MFA, when I decided to go, I it was a hard decision because my husband, it's been like we got married, it's been like 29 years, we never separated. So it was a big decision for me and my husband, um, but he sacrificed his two years for me and uh, he stayed here, I went there. Uh, and uh, when I went there in two weeks, I'm like, I cannot stay here. I, this is not possible for me and I, I am going back. And then my two sons were calling me every day, mom, this is your lifelong dream. You should stay, you should finish. And that's how I finished my, uh, uh, my education. And I'm so blessed to study there. It's, the school was amazing and the faculty, I still, I am still connected with all my faculties, um, Jason, Carl, Ryan, Bethany, um, and all my friends, all, they all are so good. Uh, of course, they all have their different paths, but um, we all are very much friends and very much connected. And I feel like I'm very blessed. I'm very grateful that you're- My parents supported me a lot, um, my mom and my dad. Um, I never say it, but I want to say in social media that I love you, Ma. I call my mom Ma. And of course I love my dad too, but that's, everyone knows, but my, I never say it to my mom. Oh, nice, nice. So, yeah. uh, there is one question. Um, in terms of the, um, where are you at right now in, in your art projects? Linda, you were sharing this uh, chair 
COVID chair, so called. Uh, and so, what is the the next, um, or what is the next project that you're uh, working on right now? And the same question goes to Kalpana. So, Linda, can you share where you're at with your projects and where you're heading? And the same thing for Kalpana. Then we have another one that we can um, share. I've just I've decided to add to the stack. I'm adding to the stack now. Uh, I'm keeping numbers. I'm keeping brown. I'm keeping data. Um, I'm keeping cho milk chocolate, the milk chocolate color. Uh, it seems to be the least egregious in terms of brown skin. Uh, uh, too dark makes people uncomfortable. Too light makes people uncomfortable. The milk chocolate seems to make everybody happy. I think it's because it looks a lot like food. It looks a lot like it's edible. Uh, and so now to that stack, I'm adding Victorian history and I'm doing a great deal of uh, research on uh, where were Latin Americans in America? Where were the Mexicans? Where were the Mexican Americans? Where were the Latinos at uh, between uh, say 1835 and the 1900s, early 1900s? Where were we? What were we doing? Uh, what did we do to build America? We were on the railroads, uh, 70,000 to 100,000 Mexican and Mexican Americans and Tejanos were hired by the railroads to build uh, the tracks from uh, Texas all the way across the Southwest to the gold rush in California. We also participated in the Civil War. Um, there's a great deal of history to be discovered and to talk about. And uh, the questions that are coming up and driving this particular portfolio of work, this upcoming work is uh, the politics of power. Uh, when the great barons of uh, America, the great first corporate barons, the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, uh, the Fords were developing their massive fortunes that are still alive today, where were the working class? Where were the essential workers then? And I'm really focusing on the idea of rather than unskilled workers because they called Mexicans at that time who actually split the rails. They made the rails out of wood for the railroads with an ax because there was no machine that could spit them out. And they called these men unskilled workers so that they could live in camps and their wives came and their children came with them. It's part of the history of the contribution of Mexicanos, Mexicans and Mexican Americans out of Texas when Texas was annexed. So I'm doing a great deal of study of the history and I'm adding that to my stack. And now I'm coming up with uh, what I'll call um, uh, a series of installations that incorporate sculpture, works on paper, uh, uh, many different elements in large size to talk about the politics of color, class, culture, and power. And that's where I'm headed. And definitely the, the color of the chocolate is yummy. I want to yummy. eat them all. Yes, <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is yummy. And that's what I think stops people from being afraid of the idea of brown. It's very it's cute. He looks like he's chocolate made out of like an Easter bunny. Absolutely, yeah. It's fantastic. So he's edible, he's delicious, mm -hmm. addictive. Totally delicious. <coughs> uh, thank you, Linda. And Kalpna, how's, um, where are you at? You were showing the constellations and what is the next project that you're arriving on? Yeah, so I want to work on constellation, which is uh, Luna mentions, and we call it in Nakshatra. Nakshatra is a uh, very popular in um, Hindu culture, hopefully, um, as we talked about yesterday, that it is kind of just a star constellation. And then if someone, it's a sign. So uh, again, I believe and not believe at the same time. But um, anyway, so when the person, when a child born, um, people can see what time or what month, what day he or she born, and then they can check the nakshatra, the constellation at that time, and then they can stay the whole future or the whole life. And we always match the, that nakshatra when uh, someone gets married. My son recently got married. Um, yeah, so if the nakshatra matches, then only it will be a good marriage. Um, I never matched with my husband. I'm glad that I never did that. Uh, so I can say that, okay, it's 30 years and we are still together. It doesn't matter if matches or not. 
So I'm working on that conflict also. So I'm making the embroidery on the window screen about that nakshatra, and I'm making uh, the nakshatra they do not they do not match with each other. So that's twenty eight. So this will be on my project. I have a lot of other research about nakshatra, so I'm working on that. I'm also making my own papers. Uh, so I the idea of uh, making my own papers and then uh, making some uh, art books. I mean, Journals that Linda said, but I want to make some tiny books about the and making prayers again connected with the cultural mm -hmm. idea. Great. We have one comment for both of the artists from TJ Austin it, uh, saying it's really interesting to hear both artists and to see their work, different techniques, different backgrounds, mm -hmm. and just stunning outcomes. So thank you. Did, um, thank you. I'm just sharing what is coming up. Any other questions, audience, please? We have still uh, some time to um, talk about different issues with Sharon. Do you want to go to some of the questions <clears throat> that we have? Well, one of the questions that it's kind of a leap in direction, but it's something that I'm very interested in. Uh, first of all, I think it's interesting that all four of us are either immigrants or at some point we're the children of immigrants. Um, and, and it's interesting that we're all here together. Uh, what was your family's response when they learned that you were an artist? They had no choice. <laughs> I could not say that. <laughs> they, they just... But I, I, yeah, I, I am very stubborn and I stuck with it that I want to become an artist. Um, no choice. So, I, 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 my first memory of painting was at four. Wow. No, and I remember, I, I remember it viscerally. I remember the smell of the paint and the feel because it was finger painting on the floor. Little kids, you know, in kindergarten, they do like little finger paints on the floor. And I was on my knees. I, I can feel it. If I, I, if I go back to it, I could see what I did. Wow. And I can feel the paint on my hands. I can smell it. It's a visceral experience. And, uh, I'm an Air Force brat. So I traveled a great deal as a child from three to 23. I was traveling constantly. So my invisible friend was my crayons and my paints and my papers and my art plans and my art supplies. It's, it's so, it, it showed up really early. And uh, I made an announcement to my family when I was very young that I would be uh, an artist, that I would be married with children. I wanted that and that I would have a spiritual core to my life. And I have pretty much allowed that, you know, out of the mouths of babes to uh, uh, guide me in my life's choices. Did they ever get yeah. any grief about it? No, they had no choice. It was, not good. It was just accepted. Well, when, even when I, was in, when I was in high school, I had the keys to the art department. You know, when I was in college, I had the keys to the, I mean, nobody ever really, they were like, oh, just let her go. She's, this is what she's meant to do. Yeah. Uh, I think it's important to accept yourself, you know, as soon as possible, to accept yourself as soon as possible, make a firm dedication to your, de to your decision and, and make the best of it. Get the most out mm -hmm. of it. Get the most out of your choice. I'm very grateful that uh, uh, Kavla, that your that your that your family, your husband, and your children did not accept no privilege, no path, and no power either. They obviously didn't if they encouraged you to follow your privilege, to follow your path, and to follow your power. Yeah, they did. And they're happy for you. My whole Congrats. family did. Yeah. Congratulations. I you know there's a there's a point where you, any individual has to know who, what they're meant to do. Everybody has to know what they're meant for, or else as you get older, you have too many regrets. You have to choose and go for it. Go for broke. I'm glad I did. I'm very grateful. Yeah, me too. I'm grateful yeah. that you followed it, and I'm grateful that I did, and we all did. <laughs> go for it. I think that community is such an important thing, and that's partly why we are doing this, is is so that other artists can see that they're not alone, that they are part of a larger community. Um, I wonder how each of you relate to your own communities and how you built them or are building them. 
I I don't know that many people, that many Indian um, organization or like um, um, like I don't have that many friends here. I do have my family here, but of course they they have none of them are in, in art. So I had to find my own way, and I had to make my connection. I had to find it for me. And I don't think it's necessary to find uh, Indian community. I. I feel like I can make my own community. Yeah. You, you said that you were still in touch with all of your yes, important faculty and that's a big part of your community at this point. And I told them when I was leaving, I told them that don't think that I'm leaving. I keep sending you my new work and then you have to give me all the suggestions all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they're amazing, it's amazing faculty. My experience is that there's many different kinds of communities that one can establish in a lifetime. And there's many different types of communities that you need to be able to have a happy life, uh, depending on who you are and what your needs are. You can have an intellectual community. You can have an art community. You can have a family community. You can have a spiritual community. You can have a, a community based on culture or history, right? You can have a culture based on what feminism, uh, and you can have a, a community of people who know things that you don't know and that you mentors, a community of mentors is what, and that is what I would recommend to everyone is to begin devising a community of mentors, individuals who are doing what you want to do and you don't know how, and that you can ask questions. Of. I have many communities and uh, uh, many communities and I'm connected to many people uh, on multiple levels all over the place. Um, and uh, and I, they know that they know that I, they are meaningful to me, and that they provide me with the sustenance that I need to uh, continue working. But as an artist, I'm pretty solitary in a lot of ways. I'm not always out and about. You really won't see me out and about a lot. Uh, if you ever need me, I'm always around somehow or another. But I don't. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much a lot in my head and pretty much a lot in the process because I'm pretty serious about the work and uh, uh, I need the communities, but I'm not surrounded by a lot of people, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have good conversations with a lot of people. I have good visits with friends and colleagues that I enjoy a great deal, but I'm not the kind of person that needs to be my solitude means a great deal to me because that's where I find the image. That's where I find the work. And that's, you know, I spend most of my time in, in terms of face to face these days with my mother and my father, whom I'm very grateful are still alive and with us in Whittier, Adam and Helen Vallejo, and with my sons and their wives and my grandchildren. And uh, in helping uh, neighbors that are, are, um, are need help, they need some help at this time. Uh, doing sort of, sort of small small acts of charity, um, and uh, I'm on Zoom a lot. <laughs> I'm on Zoom a great deal, but and I know that community is important, but um, I think an artist really needs to be willing to spend that alone time to find out who they are and what they're doing, and to develop the work that they want and to have that work acknowledged in some way that satisfies them. I think that's a perfect place to stop. We're just at 5.30. I wanna thank you both again for being here with us and sharing your experiences and your work. And thank you to everyone who was listening in on uh, YouTube. All my best, thank you. Thank you it's been all. a pleasure, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the positive note for this negative message that we were sending out. I guess this is a takeaway for all of us. <laughs> we all do have privilege and power and we create our own path. I thank you so very much for that. Yes. It was a pleasure having you both and hope to see you soon. Yes, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.